الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه نشهد ولا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له نشهد نشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى اصحاب الطيبين والطاهرين so jihad the word jihad in arabic comes from the root letters j H and D, Jim, Ha and Da. From the word Jahada, which has the following meanings. To toil, exert strenuously, to be diligent, to struggle, to strive after, meditate upon a specific phenomenon, to struggle against difficulties and strive with might. This root in its many forms has been used in the Holy Quran 41 times. The word jihad means exerting one's utmost power in contending with an object of disapprobation or disappropriation. It is only in a secondary sense that the word fighting with force, is, which is commonly known as holy war, and even then, this concept of fighting using force is done so as a form of defence to an aggressor or one who threatens the well-being of a system of peace. Jihad is exerting oneself to the extent of one's ability and power, whether it is by word or deed. There is absolutely nothing in the word that denotes that this striving is to be affected by the sword. Many people say that Islam has been spread by the sword, which to a certain extent may have some truth within, in, in the way that the empires and, and uh, times after the Prophet died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, the behaviours of people were not exactly Islamic. So in this sense, yes, the sword may have been used, but the true sense of the word jihad is to strive for good. According to Raghib, jihad is a struggle against a visible enemy, a devil inciting to sin, and against one's self, which incites to evil. So this can be known as jihad al-nafs. The greater inner jihad, which is al-jihad al-akbar, is a constant struggle to personal improvement and refining against the self's base desires. Jihad's meaning as war to be undertaken for the propagation of religion is unknown to the Arabic language and Islam. Imam Bukhari in his book Jihad has several chapters speaking of simple invitation to Islam which indicates that up until the time of Imam Bukhari which was 194 to 256 Hijrah the word jihad was used in the same sense as it is in the Holy Quran, and we shall look upon some verses of the Quran in a little while. Other books of tradition contain similar references. The concept of jihad has been hijacked by many to justify various forms of violence in many cases, and they have been done so against the Islamic order itself, against the pure message of Islam. Fighting in defense of faith received the name of jihad, because under some circumstances it became necessary for the truth to prosper against the evil that was in place at that time. This jihad is the lesser outer jihad known as al-jihad al-asghar. If fighting had not been permitted at a specific time when the Prophet was delivering his mission, then the truth, as in the message of Islam, would have been uprooted. And this this force that was used was only as a, as a force of protection. So but this also was done under specific conditions where situations were threatened and the well-being of individuals were threatened. Interestingly, if we compare this concept with traditions from the Indian subcontinent, within spirituality from this area, this may in some instances coincide with the uh, form of ahimsa, non-violence in which even ahimsa can be used in certain conditions to just use the form of self-defense. The greatest jihad that a Muslim must carry on is, by means of the wholesome message of the Holy Quran, is it centers on peaceful living and a life system based on sincerity, humanity, truth, forgiveness, benevolence, and mercy, and so forth. During the Prophet Muhammad's lifetime, peace be upon him, and even until now, the word jihad has almost always been used in the military sense, 
maybe due to the harsh barbaric conditions of threat present at that time, that threatened physical life as well as the mission, as mentioned earlier. Therefore, jihad-related force may have been made an obligation under certain strict conditions and contexts in order to protect populations as well as to keep the peace, order and justice under the banner of Islam. The six books of prophetic traditions in Sunni Islam, of Hadith, are full of traditions that focus on the jihad which relies on force. And some examples are as follows. One of these says, a man asked the Prophet, and what is jihad? He said, you fight against the disbelievers when you meet them on the battlefield. He asked again, what kind of jihad is the highest? He replied, the person who is killed while spilling the last of his blood. Another hadith is, I asked the Prophet, what is the best deed? He replied, to believe in Allah and to fight for his cause. It should be noted here that the time that these events occurred were times where the livelihood of a faith system which focused on the good of mankind was threatened and that it had not been fully established at that point. The culture of that time and actions within it are all proportionate to that time and place with regard to history. We now live in different times and do not live in a desert bellowing culture. Furthermore, Islam is a system which has long been established. Another point to raise here is that even at that time, the obligation to go to jihad in terms of fighting was executed under strict conditions with other factors that were borne in mind. One such example is the duties that one has towards their parents. One hadith, narrated by Anas ibn Malik, says, A man came to the messenger and said, I longed to go on jihad, but I was not able to. He said, Is either of your parents still alive? The man said, My mother. He said, Allah has instructed us in devotion to her. So if you do this, you are one who has performed Hajj, done the Umrah, and participated in Jihad. This is the value of the goodness that one should have towards their parents and the duty that comes first. Another hadith by Abdullah ibn Amr states, A man came to the Prophet wanting to do Jihad. The Prophet asked, Are your parents alive? He replied, Yes. The Prophet said, Then exhort, exert yourself on their behalf. Third hadith by Jahma narrated, I said to the Holy Prophet, O Messenger of Allah, I desire to go on a military expedition and I have come to consult you. He asked me if I had a mother and when I replied that I had, he said, stay with her because paradise lies beneath her feet. Regarding the concept and science of hadith, many factors such as time, geographical location span of where they came from, under what condition and context the hadith was said, and the line of transmission of each hadith all need to be borne into consideration. Now, if these traditions are to portray the sayings, practices, behaviours and other actions of the Prophet, questions regarding transmission, forgery, personalities involved in the narration of the information raised to our, rise to our minds. Also, we must understand that there were many, many empires which ruled after the death of the Prophet, there were many, many battles amongst Muslims and internally many forms of literature were also destroyed and forged. This happened in all schools of thought. Mainstream Sunni Islam considers hadith a complement to the Qur'an and a must to explain the message through the recorded narrations of the Prophet's life. However, these traditions were compiled over two centuries after the demise of the Prophet and also spanned only a limited geographical area after Islam had spread much further into the world. Shia Islam, although recognizes hadith as a source of information, and also with their own respective books, it does recognize that this source is fallible, especially when it contradicts the essence of the message of the Quranic ideal. Only the Quran is the complete, detailed and sufficient word of God which nobody can refute or abrogate. Whereas hadith on the other side has been compiled by men who may be subject to errors, forgetfulness and other concepts. After the Prophet passed away, greed, corruption and the lust for power and control through unethical and inhumane means returned through various empires within the Muslim world. 
And these behaviors were given the label of Islam, which a lot of which we still view today in the world is going on. This also occurs within the Western governments and powers of control and can also occur within family units where certain members of the family are known to be in control and so forth. Therefore, I believe that hadith cannot be a completely accurate or even correct portrayal of the exact concept of jihad in its full form. In my view, the various extremist groups and radicalized populations present in the world today have manipulated these hadith and use them for their own purposes. Whereas hadith is a good reference for a culture of that time and the spirit of the Prophet's life, maybe certain aspects of the hadith may be questioned and, and were only specific for that time. So scripture versus man is the issue that we're raising here. So now I'm going to go to some examples of where the word jihad is used in the Quran. Chapter 49, verse 15, says, True believers are those who believe in God and His Messenger, then attain the status of having no doubt whatsoever, and strive, and the word used to strive here is jihadu, with their money and their lives in the cause of God, these are the truthful ones. Chapter 9, verse 20, Those who believe and immigrate and strive, jihadu, in the cause of God, with their money and their lives, are for greater in rank in the sight of God, and these are the winners. Chapter 9, verse 88. As for the messenger and those who believed with him, they eagerly strived with their money and their lives. These have deserved all the good, through to all the good things, and they are the winners. At the times that force is used and mentioned in the Holy Book, we must look at the whole picture and understand that the force used is in proportion to upholding the Quranic message of goodness against evil and promoting this especially where life is threatened and certain individuals who are involved in the propagation of Islam, their livelihood and mission has been threatened. Chapter 6 verse 151 <coughs> says, You shall not kill. God has made life sacred, except in the course of justice. These are his commandments to you that you may understand. Okay, I've got a few more verses, so there's six more verses. I'll go through them as quickly as I can. Chapter 4, verse 90. If they leave you alone, refrain from fighting you, and after you offer a hand of peace, then God gives you no excuse to fight them. Verse 161 of chapter 8 says, If they resort to peace, so shall you. And put your trust in God. He is the hearer and the omniscient. Chapter 2, 256. There shall be no compulsion in religion. Chapter 7, 199 verse. You shall resort to pardon, advocate, tolerance, and disregard the ignorant. And the last one, chapter 60, verse 8. God does not enjoin you from befriending those who do not fight to you because of religion. And do not evict you from your homes. You may befriend them and be equitable towards them. God loves the equitable. So in a nutshell, we have viewed jihad in terms of its linguistic component in Arabic and mentioned it from the aspect of prophetic traditions and its mention in God's book. It is true that due to the events in one's family, maybe in one's nation, in one's society, culture or so on, as at the moment you can see Muslims in the West are facing a very difficult time uh, due to politics and what's going on in the world. And also within the Middle East, Muslims are facing invasions um, and various other things. One's personal belief system can be affected and then as a human being we may react in certain ways uh, within our psyche and we may experience inner terror, suffering, trauma, hurt, which may lead to frustration, anger, fear and the motivation to stand up to our given identities using the tools that we perceive we have around us at our disposal, believing that they are the truth. Quite often we view this in two ways. One way may be in standing up for the greater good of society, concentrating on uplifting people and their qualities of human beings as one. And these things may enrich us, our surroundings and societies in the world, so that we may do good no matter who we do it towards. Another way may be that we may assert a very sort of aggressive stance and we may assert our identity in the form of anger and frustration 
and take it out upon people within our vicinities, countries, nations, and so on and so forth. Individuals who end up as scapegoats to a so-called martyrdom, whilst the perpetrators themselves are lost in their lust for greed, power, and control in this worldly life that is so material, transient, and egoistic. So we see that certain individuals may be recruited to go on jihad, and this will be done from people who are higher up, who themselves will not do anything. So they, they just want to be in power at the expense of people's lives. Do we accept what we are told at face value by those in power? Do you really think that we can take that as gospel? Do we read, research, reflect, and meditate upon and use our own innate God-gifted awareness between right and wrong, with self-knowledge and political awareness? Imam Ali salam said that the prof who was the Prophet's cousin and son-in-law, he has mentioned in part of his last will and testament, persist in jihad in the cause of God with your money, your souls, and your tongue. The Prophet's grandson and Imam Ali's son, Imam Hussein salam, sacrificed his life on the plains of Karbala in present-day Iraq, where the corrupt evil ruler of that time, who was called Yazid, slayed Imam Hussein and his family. The Prophet's family was treated very badly due to themselves not submitting to the rule of that time. Yazid was a man who engaged in many transgressions in terms of his behavior and the way that he treated people. This, in my view, is an example of jihad where one struggles for the good of humanity and the generations that are to come. And within that, you see today that Imam Hussein is still being spoken about and it has been exemplified as an epitome of justice and tolerance for every human being with whom, in, with whom injustice is being perpetrated no matter to which religion they belong to and to which form the injustice is being done. This struggle for peace and justice is a symbol of universal struggle for peace and justice and for the elimination of violence and terrorism in the world. And one of the most inspiring sayings of Imam Hussein is, if you do not have a religion, at least be a free man in your life in this, in this world. And what does this mean? This means that the human being innately has that awareness to differentiate between good and evil in his or her natural, pure state, which is the fitrah. Much more easily than if engulfed in shrouds of biased conditions and ideologies which are not serving the purpose of mankind. So, a lot of people view different divisions within groups as us and them. But it's about raising this vibration within us and raising this fitra and this, con this concentration of good that exists within us and this realization as we, all of us, no matter who we are, we are a collective consciousness. As one nation or ummah of mankind, and we should all stick together and fight this jihad together against all things evil to encourage the greater good for ourselves, for others, and for this world. Verse 256 of chapter 2 in the Holy Quran says, There shall be no compulsion in religion. The right course has become clear from the wrong, and whoever rejects false deities and believes in Allah has grasped a firm handhold which will never break, and Allah is the hearing and knowing. May Allah guide us and give us the ability to focus within ourselves first, to refine, polish and uplift so we can do the same externally for the simple sake of doing good with no incentive. And this is true jihad and this is true Islam.